practice the usual clinical manifestations that can be seen in these patients. And what I'm trying to signify with this diagram is that, uh, let me say, uh, this is the left side, this is the right side. You can see person can raise his right arm. So that means uh, that the problem is not in the left side of the brain, obviously. But what I want to draw your attention is the gaze of the patient. Uh, the standard statement is whenever there is a cortical bleed. Uh, remember, we'll talk about pontine bleeds also. We'll talk about cortical bleed. But if there's a cortical or a subcortical bleed occurring in a person, then the person will look towards the side of the stroke. So as I said, the clinical features will be the face of the patient will sag. Then gradually arm and the leg weakness as the internal capsule gets involved in these patients because the penetrating arteries are the ones which are getting afflicted. So uh, therefore the leg weakness will also start occurring in these patients. Uh, at the same time, you can also notice that the eyes of the patient, uh, both of the eyes would be deviated. There is eye, eye deviation. And in pontine stroke, the statement will be that the patient looks away from the side of the stroke, whereas whenever it's a cortical or a subcortical lesion, then the eye deviation will occur towards the lesion or towards the bleed. And uh, this can be written in MCQs in a different way also. The eye deviation will always be occurring uh, opposite to the side of weakness, opposite to hemiplegia or opposite to the focal neurological deficit that is occurring in the person. Uh, it's a very simple straightforward fact but you see in my exam where you have limited time at your disposal there is chances that this can go wrong so we'll just quickly practice it in a person who's having a, a hypertensive intracerebral hemorrhage the eyes will be deviated towards which side your answer is it will be deviated to the side wherever the bleed is present slash it will be opposite to whichever side the weakness is present in a patient if the bleed is infratentorally located, the chances of development of stupor and coma will be relatively much more faster. And uh, then as the raise ICP will increase further, there might be development of chain strokes breathing. There would be Bayard's breathing developing in a patient that's irregularly irregular respiration. So I've just written deep uh, intermittent. In fact, I can just write it. I mean, for Bayard's breathing, I'm writing there would be a deep breath, that's okay, but it would be a deep intermittent breathing occurring in a patient. In fact, this statement is more of an English one. Uh, there are two statements I said, chain strokes will be periodic, hypo, then there might be an apneic episode, then hyperventilation. And in Bayard's breathing, it's an irregularly irregular respiration developing in a patient. The cerebral edema that uh, accompanies the bleed will tend to deteriorate. I mean, most of the time, there can be an extensive cerebral edema, which would be occurring. I mean, even if the person does not expire immediately, the cerebral edema in these patients will develop and most of the time the cerebral edema tends to evolve over the next 12 to 72 hours. So most of the time I can say the first three days would be very critical and you will have to deploy measures. I mean the fight of yours would be that in the initial few days after the onset of stroke you have to control the raised ICP of the patient. The CT scan the, might be showing evidence of a midline shift. Uh, the bleed might expand further. You can confirm that by doing a CT angiography, but because of this fast deterioration, we need to be aware of what's going to happen in a person. And in some questions, the clinical history can be slightly different from what I'm mentioning at the moment because it may not always be the involvement of these uh, penetrating branches that I was talking about uh, initially. Uh, in some cases, you might even be having, uh, I mean, due to involvement of the smaller branches, you may not have only the involvement of the internal capsule, but thalamus can be involved, pons can be involved. So what I'll do in my subsequent slide will be uh, explain to you regarding what are going to be some peculiar features if there's going to be a thalamic hemorrhage versus what's going to be a feature if a person is having a pontine hemorrhage. Pontine, you very well know I'm going to talk about pinpoint people, so no big deal. And then you could have a cerebellar hemorrhage as well. So let's look at some of the specific features that we can be encountering with respect to uh, these subsites where the bleed could be present. Now the features that can be developing in a patient of thalamic hemorrhage will uh, be hemiparesis that can be explained by the involvement of the internal capsule of the patient. But uh, you could also read about aphasia and apraxia with thalamic hemorrhage and the query is usually that aphasia with a thalamic hemorrhage, I mean, you know, why? Then I can say that thalamus is a common gateway. I mean, it's not only a relay center for sensation like pain, but it is also a relay station for speech as well. So what he says is that if the thalamus on the dominant side of the brain is affected, aphasia can also be seen in a person having a thalamic role. And similarly, if it's a non-dominant involvement occurring in a person, then you might be having his development of constructional apraxia, where the person will not be able to draw geometrical shapes, etc. Along with this, visual deficit will be occurring. The visual deficit that will develop would be mostly in the form of a homonymous 
hemianopia in a patient. Aphasia and apraxia is what we traditionally read with cortical stroke. But what I am saying is that even with the thalamus involvement, we do read about it because thalamus is a common gateway for allowing information being relayed with respect to the speech as well. So aphasia and apraxia can be described. And then, you know, specific findings with respect to the eyes could be present, like whichever side the bleed is present on that side, we might be able to demonstrate uh, ipsilateral Horner syndrome. That would be ptosis, meiosis, you know, phthalmos. And uh, simultaneously, there might be a deviation of the eyes. Like it might look like person is trying to look towards his nose. So with thalamic hemorrhage, one ipsilateral Horner syndrome, uh, then the contralateral eye of the patient might look inferly. It might look down and at the same time towards the nose, that is downwards and medially towards the nose of the patient or I can just say the word skew deviation. Skew deviation means that uh, there's an acquired, uh, in fact, I can just write it. I mean, when when you read this word, no skew deviation, it basically means a vertical misalignment of the eyes. And why is this vertical misalignment of the eyes occurring? Then this vertical misalignment cannot be ascribed to a single uh, cranial nerve involvement or cannot be ascribed to a single ocular muscle involvement. You see, brain has a complex system by which it's able to regulate a conjugate gaze. So lots of time in thalamic hemorrhage, the eyes of the patient might be looking towards the nose. And I'm using the word skew deviation to say a vertical misalignment that cannot be ascribed to a single, you know, a single, I cannot pinpoint to a single ocular nerve involvement or a single cranial nerve involvement in a patient because there would be multiple centers regulating the gaze of the patient. Now these patients might develop a contralateral chronic pain syndrome. By contralateral chronic pain syndrome, syndrome I mean that uh, the same patient he has suffered severe hemiplegia so two months after the onset of stroke I mean he's the person is still bedridden and luckily surviving now the nurse is uh, doing a sponging of the body of this person because he cannot take care of himself so every time like we put water on the body of a person like we're trying to give a bath or we're trying to do sponging then over one half of the body that is contralateral to wherever the lesion had occurred in the brain there would be searing pain or burning pain experienced by the patient. Lots of time they may not be able to express that, but uh, the wincing of the face of the patient or the expressions of the patient can give an idea that the person is uh, not comfortable. So there would be a searing pain even when water falls on the hand of a person or water falls on the leg of a person or like I said, the nurse is doing simple sponging and the patient is wincing as if in extreme great, great amount of pain. Uh, this presentation is what we regularly read as Dejerin Roussy syndrome and this uh, Dejerin Roussy should not be mixed up with Dejerin Sotas. Uh, Dejerin Sotas would be a hereditary motor sensory neuropathy and Dejerin syndrome plain that's gonna be medial medullary syndrome. I repeat that again I've written Dejerin Roussy here only but then we also read about Dejerin syndrome which is medial medullary syndrome anterior spinal artery involvement. And then we read about Dejerin Sotas, that is hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. Then we'll also speak regarding uh, pontine hemorrhage occurring in a person where the prognosis would even be bad. I mean, uh, the, the person will deteriorate even much more faster. You read about deep coma, there would be development of quadriplegia and pinpoint pupils that will be reactive to light. I mean, most of the time when a question comes with respect to pain point pupils, he'll either make you think in terms of possibility of drug overdosage by a vagabond or a person who's had a pontine stroke. The differentiating feature clinically would be respiratory rate of a patient because if there's a drug overdosage, the respiratory rate would be relatively lesser. And because, I mean, in this MCQ, every time you read about pinpoint bleed, then clinically in the question, always look at the respiratory rate value. If he mentions about respiratory depression, he also mentions regarding hypothermia, then you need to think in terms of possibilities of drug overdosage in a patient. But if he talks about hyperapnea, faster breathing rate and hyperthermia, I'll say that again. If a question simply is talking about a person brought with pinpoint pupils, unresponsive to command, GCS of the patient being, let me say, uh, 6 on 15, and he is having uh, bradypnea the respiratory rate of the patient is slow, only six breaths per minute. There is a hypothermia. One should think in terms of a drug overdosage. In contrast, if you read about hyperapnea, hyperthermia, and even excessive sweating, hyperhidrosis, then the 3H would, I mean, clinically speaking, I can say that this would help you. And obviously the 
the best way for identification would be to go about a CT head or a MRI, whichever is feasible or available. And we can do a uh, we can do a urinary drug screen of the person also subsequently. So if a question begins by saying a vagabond, unconscious, unresponsive, brought to the hospital, do have a look at the vitals, the respiratory rate of the person, the body temperature of the patient, whether it's having profuse sweating or whether the body is cool to touch, and you will get a bit of hints regarding whether to answer as drug overdosage or pontine hemorrhage. Then some patients could be unfortunately due to hypertension having a cerebellar hemorrhage as well. In a question on cerebellar hemorrhage, he'll again uh, initially begin by describing a known case of hypertension. Like this guy is a uh, is a senior manager in ICIC bank. He's taking a sales meeting and then, you know, in the middle of the meeting, he starts explaining this guy with hypertension is non-compliant with his medication. So today is taking a sales meeting and suddenly he starts having this occipital headache. So first he thought that maybe he had not taken the medicine and that is why the occipital headache has suddenly developed. Lots of time hypertension patients might complain of, you know, frontal or occipital headache. So initially thought maybe he did not take medicine, but then he deteriorated very fast. He started having vomiting. He, he was maybe standing up and he was giving a PowerPoint presentation and he started having a, a gait ataxia. The gait was so bad that he was trying to deviate to one side and somebody offered him a chair and said, sir, please sit down. What really happened? Are you fine? And what you're noticing is that uh, there are some involuntary movements which are occurring in the eyes of the patient. Uh, obviously, a f family member will just say that I noticed some involuntary movements and you as a doctor will understand that cerebellar hemorrhage can have a pontine involvement. If there is a pons involvement, which will occur because cerebellum would be just anterior, uh, cerebellum will be present just posterior to the brainstem of the person. So as a cerebellar hematoma expands, then pons involvement will start occurring in a person and as a result of it there would be what is called as ocular bobbing now ocular bobbing should not be mixed up with the down beating nystagmus because here you would be having a spontaneous deviation of the eyes and in the mcq will trouble you with you know the terminology uh, that this would be a spontaneous uh, upward movement or a downward movement so your answer would be this would be spontaneous downward deviation of both the eyes of the patient and uh, this is mainly occurring because of pontine involvement. Do not mix it with the uh, downbeat nystagmus, but you should remember this would be ocular bo bobbing because downbeat nystagmus, the eye movement would be different from what is happening in ocular bobbing here. It is a downward movement, whereas when it comes to a uh, downbeat nystagmus, it's an upward movement. So ocular bobbing, spontaneous downward deviation of the eyes due to pontine involvement can occur. Then because the brainstem is so close, there can be involvement of the cranial nerves, which will make it impossible for the person's speech to be understood. Like initially, he was giving a PowerPoint presentation and he was rattling off, you know, figures that, okay, the uh, like he was telling his credit card executives, you have not met the sales targets, you have not sold the XYZ number of credit cards. This is the sales in this target that I was achieving. Now the speech has become unclear. The guy is puking. He's having subsequently even a dysphagia. Somebody offered him water. He could not drink it. Might aspirate and die also. And the bleed can be lethal enough to contribute to a raise ICP and contribute to development of a hydrocephalus. So, I mean, in some questions, they'll obviously mention those classical features like ocular bobbing, gait ataxia with a, a headache occurring in a patient with hypertension. Then when you pick up these words, hypertension patient, sudden onset headache, then gait ataxia, ocular bobbing, uh, brainstem involvement like dysarthria, dysphagia, can't talk, can't speak, then uh, can't speak and can't eat also. So you have to think in terms of a posterior bleed, that's a cerebellar hemorrhage. On the other hand, if he starts talking about features like uh, uh, pinpoint pupils uh, with the features that have said hyperpnea, hyperthermia, hyperhidrosis, it could be a pontine bleed. For thalamic hemorrhage, usually he's going to give you a chronic presentation. Acute presentation can also be picked up and as I said, a peculiarity that you could be having uh, aphasia occurring even with the thalamic involvement. And uh, in case the standard presentation of bleed occurring with respect to the internal capsule, I mean, in this particular description, the one on the slide at the moment, I've given a description with respect to the site of lesion being the internal capsule of the patient.